Oh, I've been <laughs> silenced. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us uh, here on a temperate Wednesday night here in Minnesota. My name is Patrick Strait. I'm the author of the new book, Funny Thing About Minnesota, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of Twin Cities Comedy. We have such an incredible event tonight. So glad everybody could join us. I would just want to go ahead and jump right into it before we talk a little bit about the evening here. I want to introduce everybody because you didn't come to see me. I have the all-star lineup of all-star lineups. I have here tonight Scott Hansen, the original, the kingpin of Twin Cities Comedy. We have Jeff Turbino, the original of Twin Cities Comedy. We have Liz Winstead, you know her as the co-creator of The Daily Show. We have Joel Madison, writer for some amazing shows like Malcolm and uh, Eddie, and then some guy named Louie. Uh. Mr. Louie Anderson joining us here. We are all over the place. We are in California, Florida, Minnesota, Las Vegas. Guys, thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You know, that was almost the exact lineup that we used to go by. <laughs> not too far off. Not too far I, off. I, I was usually the MC or a lot of times. I, I like being oh, the wait, MC. Wait, wait, before we rewrite history, okay. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, we planted the flag. All right, it was just me. All right, can we get that no, part straight? <laughs> it was just Jeff. Stick a flag in the ground. Forever no, around. Right? <laughs> we did our show on the Dumont Network. Uh, yes, I did. No, we have got, oh man, we have got a long night ahead of us. We have got a lot of big personalities. We got a lot to get into here. I'm really excited about it. Real quick, let me set the stage for everybody to do a little bit of housekeeping before we jump into it. For those of you who are watching, uh, we encourage you, interact with us. Leave us comments, leave us your questions. We'll stop throughout the presentation. We'll ask questions for everybody here, uh, whether it's the comedians, whether it's myself, I don't know why you wanna ask me questions when you have these five talented people here, but if you do, happy to do it. Uh, just type your questions in and we'll stop throughout. And then of course, first shameless plug of the night, make sure that you go online to the Minnesota Historical Society and order the book, Funny Thing About Minnesota, available for order right now so you can read up on all the stories, all the controversy, all the great things that we're gonna talk about here tonight. All right. I'm going to jump into it. Let's get it started. Let's stir it up. There's no better place, in my opinion, to start here. Let's start at the beginning. So let me set the scene, and then I'm going to start asking some questions. So to set the scene, we're going to go back to the beginning. For those who aren't familiar with where this whole comedy thing in Minnesota started, I take you back 1977. There was a bar in Northeast Minneapolis called Mickey Finn's. It was in the downstairs of the Union Building. And at this point in time, you know, these days we all really take comedy kind of for granted. Any bar, any club, any theater you go to, it feels like you can see comedy any night of the week. Back in 1977, that was not the case. Outside of maybe LA or New York, the idea of seeing an entire comedy show just didn't exist. That just didn't happen. And in 1977, a bartender for Mickey Finn's went out to California, saw a stand-up show, came back and said, hey, I think this could be great. And the owner, Steve Billings, decided, it's cheap, might bring some people in the door, let's give it a shot. And he started his own comedy contest, got some great and maybe not so great comedians through there uh, to try it out, but it had a good enough response that he decides, you know what, let's keep this comedy thing rolling, let's put together a regular comedy night, the first regular stand-up comedy night in the Twin Cities, and I need somebody to be at the helm of this one. And let's start it off. Jeff Gerbino, you're the man that Steve sits down there and says, hey, I want to put down, I want to put together a stand-up comedy show. How do I get started? You know what? He doesn't even ask you. He just says, you figure it out. Figure out how to get people in, figure out how to get comics. So let me ask you, first question here, Jeff, where do you start? When he comes to you and says, hey, figure out how to put together a stand-up comedy show when there's never been a stand-up comedy show here, where do you begin? Well, I, I give him credit for having the one great wisdom. I finished second in that comedy contest. And instead of asking Gary Johnson to do it, he asked me. So I, I must give him proper credit on that one for picking the right guy. I had been kind of stumbling and bumbling around with my brother, Frank, who later go back to New York and we eventually finish up as a lieutenant in the NYPD. But uh, he was my biggest and first fan. And he, we were going around any place I could get on. And the only thing back then was, it was BC, you know, before cable, before yeah. comedy clubs before cell phones, before children, all right? Way, way back. And the only thing you have was stupid gong shows and I would get gonged every time. And so I had this desire to perform, you know? And uh, I had had one great show under my belt prior to that. And it was at the Grand Mantle in St. Cloud where my brother was going to school at the time. It was then called St. Cloud State. 
And uh, unfortunately for me, I killed that night at this Grand Mantle. And there's nothing worse than early in your career killing. Because from then on, I spent the next six months trying to get a laugh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I and then this came along, and I, I just went into it heart and soul. He gave me a list of the guys who had been in the contest. Most of them did not want to perform again. It was a one-time thing. <laughs> but I was able to dredge a few people out of that list. So our first show was like January 7, 1978. And... Uh, that's that's more people than we had that night that you see in that photo there. <laughs> that must have been after a trip story. That was a pretty good crowd that night. You got to see uh, people that's their heads against the wall. You're saying, yeah. Well, it was, you know, the the stunning thing was we had nothing to start with, you know, except a microphone and uh, not even a stage in the beginning. And we finally, you know, started to put things together. And I found the first night we had four comics uh, that night. And I wound up stretching. I had about 15 minutes of material, which I somehow stretched into 35. And when it was over, I thought Steve was going to fire me because it was like the show had gone like 70 minutes, you know. <laughs> and he went, that's pretty good. All right. I'll see you next week. You know, and he gave me my 25 bucks and I went merrily on my way. <laughs> and then each week we started to work a little harder, work a little harder. And then a guy named Bill Bauer came along and right after him was Scott. And uh, Scott was intrinsically helpful. He was he was one of those guys who just, how can I help you, you know? And Scott immediately uh, started thinking, like, here's something we can do. Here's something we can do. And the next thing you know, we were working together. And uh, it wasn't always the case with Bill, but uh, we had a wild card. In him, and we used this sort of wild energy that we had. And we started to attack the audience, you know? And we said, let's get him down here. And then, you know, and I went crazy. You know, I went down to people at the Tribune and the Pioneer Press. There was nothing that could stop me. And eventually I got friendly with some radio people in town, Mesa Kincaid, uh, Dan yeah, Hertzbart. Hey, Remember Mesa? Oh, passed away some years ago. Yeah, Mesa Kincaid, a.k.a. Cheryl Holmes is the real name. Uh, Dan yeah, Hertzbart uh, put me on CCO and the whole world was listening to WCCO back then. Yeah. And all of a sudden I went on CCO and boom, we got this sort of CCO crowd down there. And they were kind of expecting... I don't know, Buddy Hackett, Shecky Green. We weren't offering that. <laughs> we, were, we were offering Scott and Bill and me. And I remember Scott would go, some nights he would look at me and he knew I was in New York. He'd go, they're just Minnesotans, Jeff. They're just Minnesotans. <laughs> he would just play I would get so pissed. I said, not get anything. I'd got to hammer them over the head with it. You know? But they, were, they weren't even aware of the fact that they had an accent. That cracked me up. <laughs> oh, you New Yorkers, you got accents there, you know. Hey, that's what you got going. Oh, yeah. Dude. I said, but you don't know, we don't have no accent here. Oh, no. And so it was just, it was a real challenge, you know. And then yeah. we came down the road and uh, we kept working and we kept working and we got stories in the trip, stories in the Pioneer Press. And every time we'd have a story, that little 50 seat would be, I don't know. Bill was crazy. That was why we gave him the door. He would somehow get 75 to 100 people where only 50 belonged. You know, <laughs> and you remember that, Louie. You know how. Yeah. It, you know, awesome. yeah. Bill was a mastermind, and we never, none of us wanted to do that. No, we didn't want to so. ask anybody for, we didn't want to deal with any of that. Yeah. And, and, when uh, would, and when it would come time to raise the, the, the price, you would be the one who would go to Bill and go, you got to bump it up another buck. <laughs> <laughs> Well, was okay. like, I mean, I figured more dollars to get it. We didn't have the balls to say it, but we know he would. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, you know, the amazing thing was, I, I was a little bit before me. I came in 78, but the greatest thing about the club was we all did as much time as we had. And then the show was over. <laughs> yeah. And oh, yeah, if yeah. another comedian came, they could perform because we yeah. we just had seventy minutes or a hundred minutes. You know, I mean, it was really great. It, when I see that picture that he flashed, it made me very uh, nostalgic. And that was a nice little haven we had. We loved that. There's a little hallway right back from that stage, and that was our lean to to. Uh, well, Liz, I'm disappointed you didn't notice my stylish tie vest I was wearing there. It was made for me by a seamstress that uh, went to a Bruce Springsteen concert with me. Yeah, it's very, uh, very, you're very Toma. 
Oh, man, I was, <laughs> I, I was fashion forward, baby. I yeah, was fashion I, forward. I like but I, I have to say, as somebody who went as a patron to Mickey Finn's um, and was a college kid at the time, um, this is my dog. I just got this dog. I apologize in advance. I know. It's great. It's all good. We we are we would yeah. like that. We want someone to pay that much attention to us. I know. It's, it's you got to get it where you get it, people. But yeah. um, what I said, it was that place felt as New York as Minneapolis could. It was. Smart. Oh, that's a great like, comment, Liz. In, being, it felt exciting. It felt like a happening in that way where if you weren't at that show that yeah. night, it, you felt bad for people who weren't there because it was cool. You guys, it well, was really, it was cool to be there. That was the best compliment I got. I, mean, I got my first fan letter from a woman who had just been divorced. That's when people actually wrote letters with their hands. Yeah. You know? And she said, it's like, it's like your royalty gone to sea, Jeff. You're trying to raise that place up higher than it is. And I said, well, I had to because that was the only place we had to perform. You know? I and, smoking. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> I hate to say it, but that, that was a common thing back then. You know, they would, but what bugged me the most was they would puff it right up at the stage. Remember that, Louis? Scott, remember? It was like, oh, why, are you, why are you blowing smoke in my face? Why I love that. that. I absolutely <laughs> loved that. I, I was a smoker, yeah. so I was just like, "Yeah, thank you." Oh, uh, you, you, but because you would, did you used to smoke on stage back then? Really? I think I did. In fact, the picture on the cover of the book is air, the cigarette in my hand is airbrushed out. I wasn't going to say anything, but yes, that's the one. You could have left it in now because I, 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 -smokers. I remember that it was like, yeah. oh God, these people did. They, they would puff away right in front of you, and it was no big deal. Yeah. Louis, you didn't mention was a cigarette buyer. I yeah. remember. Yeah. So, right. okay, so well, you always here. plumbing cigarettes for everybody. I have no recollection of that. No, you would never buy a pack. There's no way I'm going to have control of this. Okay, so real quick, you know, we'll get back into Bill Bauer here in a second. I got a lot of questions for you, but I want to switch gears here because Scott, Jeff brought you up as kind of the, the next guy who came in to help. And I want to know, you know, okay, the first time you go into this place, I mean, like nowadays, I think, you know, the first time we go in, you know, when people think of this bar or people think of a bar where they do comedy, I think people these days have a very preconceived idea. It's like, oh, okay, there's an area where they have the comedy and people can kind of watch. Scott, walk me through it. First time you go into Mickey Finn's to see comedy, what's that like? I mean, in this, what's what's your experience going in there for the first time, even just to see it and to experience it? Well, I was pretty drunk. <laughs> yeah, you know. No, you and, weren't. Uh, I've never there. seen you drunk. Well, I've it was it was a festive night. I actually went down, uh, Tim Bauer, my high school friend, was Bill Bauer's brother. And so we went down to see Bill in the contest. And so I'm sitting at a table with a bunch of friends and Bill's friends. And I knew Bill well before he went on stage. And it was just after he got back from Vietnam. And uh, we were sitting there going like crazy. And Billings went up at the end and I started heckling him. And he said, well, maybe why, I dare you to come back next week. I was getting right. lost. Billings wasn't funny at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, all right, I'll try it. About two months later, I got the courage. And Jeff had been calling me. He wanted me to come down to fill up the time. And we went down with Bill. We originally did a comedy trio acting. Oh, yeah. What was the name of it? Dial and Hallucination. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got a poster. We never got a logo. We never got that far. That's probably good. That well, did. the smartest, smartest thing Scott ever did was get out of that group. Yeah. Well, I had to. One member was put in an insane asylum. Yes, that's right. And then there was that's Bill. Not an exaggeration. That's not an exaggeration, by the way. Mike Gorsh was his name. And he, yeah. was, he was, went away. His wife, I think this is a great. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Scott. No, it's, it's a 14 minutes for our first hippo violation, everybody. This is great. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I. You met his, or you know, you met Peg, right? Lou, no. uh, uh, Peggy Bill was Bill's wife at the time. Yeah, she was working at the Anoka Mental Hospital. Oh. Bill was making a delivery there with through an ambulance driving service. Yeah. So he comes. So that's how they met, and I mean, we were good friends before that. So when he formed this group, this guy Gorsh comes in, and his girlfriend says, 
if you don't quit this, I'm going to dump you. Well, he wouldn't quit. So she got power of attorney from his parents and had him put into an asylum. So we lost one member that way. Yeah. And, and, I, and it, it was, was, guys, it was just brutal. It was a pretty bizarre material. And Scott moved away from that material to his credit. Bill would continue to do the material in a solo form. You know, which was, again, we, you got to remember the time period. We're way back in time here, folks. And uh, there was a, today, a lot of other material we were doing, we considered homophobic, we considered sexist, we considered racist. Uh, but it wasn't for the time. You know, that's I mean, all I can say. And modernity is a bit of a sin. It just wasn't <laughs> white people. Too many white people weren't calling white people out. Let's be clear. It wasn't yeah. Either. Well, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. That, and as for me, I was necrophilia and stuff like that, Liz. Not right? racial. It was mostly necrophilia and things like that. It wasn't racial. Yeah. <laughs> no. So no, let me ask, so quick question. So okay, so I mean we've talked about, and like I said, we're gonna talk about Bill in a second, but you know, I want to talk about some of the comics who, you know, we talked about kind of the core group here, and you know, we talked about some of the well, other we have a, I think we should get everybody's first impressions, Patrick. I mean, you got mine with it coming in. And I think I'd love to hear from Joel and Liz on their very first time at Mickey Finn's. To me, that that's historical to me. And yes. I don't really know their first time necessarily. Yeah, Joel, and, Joel we, we haven't heard from you. So let's see. Yeah. Well, thank you. So the first time I was at Mickey Finn's, I was living in San Diego. And I had started doing open mics there. Uh, I'd been doing them for about a year. Once a, once a week on Sundays, they had open mic. Uh, at the comedy store in San Diego. And uh, I became a doorman there and I'd watched a lot of comics and that really was helpful. And I was visiting my mom on a little vacation uh, from San Diego. Uh, uh, shoot, this was 80. And um, I saw in the paper, they had stand up. I was like, oh, wow, that's so cool. And uh, I went in and so the comedy store in San Diego was like a big showroom and very exciting place, like 200 <laughs> And that's where we were doing stand up. But this room still had like this vibrant buzz to it. It was crazy. It was so tiny, but the people were there and just so hungry. And the comics were all like really good. It, it was really amazing because I, I didn't know what to expect. I, you know, they, in theory, they're professionals, but, you know, here, here that, in Minnesota. Was that the La Jolla story? Or was that La Jolla, yeah. Yeah, La Jolla. La Jolla. And uh, so it's like, wow, there's such a buzz. And I think I, you know, I introduced myself to Louie and, uh, uh, a few of the others, and I said, "Oh yeah, I'm doing some open mic." And they go, oh, and it's "Like now, hearing why you wanted me to do it because you needed somebody to fill the time." <laughs> yeah. oh, we just fine. wanted you to go up and do some time. That's we right. needed a Jew, Joel. What's the right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, "Oh yeah, I could go." Can I had probably five, eight minutes at the time, maybe ten. I don't know. Like, yeah, go up and do it. And uh, it's like, "Oh man," I go up, and it's just like it, it, there was just this magical, weird buzz because the room was just. Packed. It was like a jazz room almost. And uh went up and I did fine enough. And Louis said, Hey, if you want to move here, you can instantly get weekend work. And I got oh, <laughs> it's that. true though. It's but true. How did it's you true. Wind, how did you wind up in Minnesota? Uh visiting his mom. I, I was visiting my mom. She was living there. And I okay. had lived there uh a few years before. Uh I was I was uh, born in Wisconsin, but I was uh, living in Minnesota. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> All right. I just wanted the connective tissue there. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sorry, uh, I, Jeff. Uh, I didn't. I thought you heard him. But I, I moved up to Minneapolis, and then actually our extended family, my mom's family, is all from Minneapolis. So she moved up there as well, and right. uh, go Green Bay. So she and I was. That's where I moved to San Diego like two years before. Uh, I was living in Minneapolis. So San Diego, and then back to Minneapolis. I moved. And that was right at the, and I will say this right at the moment, because you'll get into this eventually, of the big comedy war. I moved back to Minneapolis, packed up everything, and there was no Mickey Finns. It was that month or two. Oh, hell, what am I going to do with my life now? And there's no internet. You can't find anybody. There's no yeah. <laughs> About two weeks later, maybe somebody I know saw it in the paper that you had, uh, uh, Louis had done started the Variety Club. So I went down there, and it was like, it was horseshit. It was, uh, what, eight people that night. And Louis said, yeah, it's not so good, but we'll figure something out. And sorry to do an impression of you, Louis. Uh, That's okay, Joe. <laughs> Actually, we, we moved, moved And we, we figured something out. Location. 
Actually, it was a better location. It was the varsity club. And yeah, it was, but for some reason, it just didn't have that buzz. And I don't know what was happening right before that moment, but then within a month or two, everything kind of settled down. We were back at Finn's, you know, going full force. So, but yeah. but it was such a cool room to play. Well, yeah, we, well, this yeah. was, a, yeah, I don't know if people can see this or not, but that was the varsity club. <laughs> that was a, uh, oh, was, wow. You can't yeah, really see, you get a glare there, but. Oh, uh, we get a glare? Yeah, that. right there. That's better. Back a little. Back a little. Back a little. No, back towards see? you. Yeah, it was a bigger room. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. a more focused room. Yeah, it was a it. Like uh, showroom. Yeah. Anyway, it's a great shot. Only one guy's alive in that picture, and it was you, Louie. All the others are gone. Gary Johnson, Dan Bradley, uh, Rocky Johnson, and Gary Johnson. And uh, I always like that shot because you're, like, sneaking in the corner, like, I'm hey. going to sneak in there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. We just had something we never had. The varsity was right in the middle of the University of Minnesota. It was just as I was getting ready to go out to L.A. And we had something we never had before, a walk-in crowd. You know, because yeah. we had to tell them to come there. It was northeast Minneapolis, you know, uh, you know, right across from McNamara is the place with the stupid football, you know, on yeah, top of it. Great. And, and, a, and a Greek steak place and a white castle. You know, what so about you? Liz? What about Liz? Yeah, She's Liz. Our last one, and then I'll shut up. Um, you know, I performed at Mickey Friends at tail, tail end because I, I did my very first open mic. Cesario was hosting open mic that sent those Sunday nights at Riggs, uh, in Seven Corners, and that's when I kicked in over there. But I would go as a patron when I was dating Jeff Sutherland. Remember him? Wow, yes, yeah. there you go. I and didn't think so, you'd admit to that. I admit to everything. I have no shame <laughs> about anything. Other um, one. And so I know, right? You know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Two so, confessions. But I really, uh, but I really do think um, it was an incredible. Not only just this core, the core group, and you all who were core at Finns. I think the thing that strikes me the most about this entire scene was. You cannot stress enough how much diverse talent, kooky, I'm seeing in the comments, you know, Chris Rain, you mentioned Rocky Johnson. There was people who were avant-garde and we could do shows in Minnesota. And partially I think it's because I think Minnesotans are so stellar, but you could do a show and have a traditional stand-up, Phyllis Wright, Rocky, you know, you could have storytelling and just weird as shit things going on performance art comedy all of it living in one in one show and it was yes it's, it's, a, think, it's a magical yeah. place and i'm not saying that because we're all from here i'm saying that because it's real and when when louis said to joel you know come here and you'll have weekend spots let's be clear mike gandolfi moved there because of, of that Harmon Leon, Joni Marchenko, who went on to run Will and Grace Louis, one of your dear friends and one of my dear friends. Incredible stand up. People came. Oh, Jeff to, Cesario moved there. Jeff from Cesario. Yes. People came yeah. to Minnesota because they could work. Nice people, too. A lot yeah. of nice people. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jeff counts because he actually came in and did a set at the uh, original Mickey Fins. And I freak him out by remembering the routine he did. <laughs> which was on the phone with his mom. It's a phone bit back and forth, like a Bob Newhart kind of thing, talking to his mom, explaining that he wasn't drafted into the Army. She didn't get it. And he's like, you remember that? And it's like, it's one of my weird proclivities. I can remember people's earliest routines, and I'll throw them back at them just to see if they remember them. You, I know you do that sometimes, Louie, too. You'll go, you're still doing that routine? And the people get that blank look on their face like, huh? What? I got some 40... Two-year-old jokes that still work. That's all. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and but I still know, do but them. But what Liz said is so true, though, is that in the beginning, I really felt there were no nobody sounded like anybody else. Mm -mm. You know, there was well, very we unique styles. Youngers for a minute. Everybody had a movie <laughs> sounded like Sid. <laughs> Certainly, everybody that came after him. Yes. It's yeah. true. You couldn't help but take, like people yeah. snap you out of doing, and I and I kind of can't even remember what it was. He was looking. Well, I think it was. The, I yeah, think I think that was that people would weird. show up. That was the other thing about Finns that made it sort of weird and magical. Rocky Johnson showed up there when I you remember it, Scott. He had a he had an aquarium with a freaking little sea snake in it, and I thought I never saw anybody bring that as a prop 
He goes, I have King Kong Spermotozoa in here. And he just went, you did all that for that joke? <laughs> he was committed. I was, I was like, yeah. And he would remember, he would write, he would handwrite an entire act. And then the next week, handwrite a different act, another 15 minutes. And I would go, show me your notes. And he would have everything written out on it. And I would go, I cannot believe you. How about taking a few minutes from what worked last week and putting it in here? And Alex had the best line about that. He goes, he just put his arm around Rocky one night. He goes, if we tried to harness you, it just wouldn't be any good. Because <laughs> that was because Rocky was just too out there. You know what I mean? And he was, I mean, he drove an Amtrak train. Okay. He was the embodiment of the Grateful Dead song, driving that train high on cocaine. He was. And you remember, Scott? He derailed that train and lost his job at Amtrak. Yes. Yeah, yeah, All right. So I, I gotta say go ahead, one thing Patrick. real quick before we go on here. For anybody who thinks, and Scott, I want to say this to you specifically because I have learned something in the last twenty minutes, and I owe you this. When me and Scott talked, and Louis, I'm bringing you into this because you know we talked about when Louis first came down and performed to Mickey Finn's and became the MC. And for those who are watching, maybe aren't familiar, the MC's job is to keep things moving, to be snappy, and get to the point. Scott Hansen said wow. to me, when me and him talked about Louis Anderson, he said, and I quote, Louis Anderson is the worst MC I have ever seen. And I said, why, Scott? Why is he the worst? And Scott, do you remember what you told me? Oh, I know exactly, because Jeff would be standing next to me. We'd be on stage, and it wasn't he was the worst MC. It was just, if you were the next act, it was hard, because Louis would get on a roll, you do really well, and he'd say, oh, our next act. What? And then he would see some guy in the audience what? and say, what's your problem? And then another 15 minutes to go to this guy. Well, you're just you're getting ready to go on stage. And we're all back in that little hole. going, oh, here he goes again. We yeah, but I listen, I, I knew that I was doing that on purpose. I was trying to get more material, but I, I took the job. Um, I don't think anyone ever wanted it. I got to be honest with you. I think I, I I did it, but you're right. I was very indulgent, and um, well, yeah, I, uh, I apologize for that. No, no, no. I, no, I, no, I no. I, I don't mean it. No, I mean, I'm not, you know, it just was part of what it was. No, I said it to um, Patrick, too. It was just like, because, you know, you know when you yeah. get, you're just starting out, and you're really getting just ready to get up, and, you know, you were doing well. You're killing as it is, and then all of a sudden, okay, I got to get ready again in 15 minutes. You know, so I would just try. I, what I would try to do is go until I really bombed and then introduce somebody. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> that was I, I, here, here. In the hallway. Here's what I want to say on that. Here's what I want to say is that I, I, in the beginning, before Louis got there, I would host the first half. We would split the show in half because we were, we were starting to get more comics. That was the big thing. Oh my yeah. God. You got eight or nine or 10 comics. People started to want to go on. That was the big change that happened in 78. And uh, when Louis came along, I started to notice that obviously he was a natural and that you were better when you weren't doing your set material. You were better yeah. bouncing off of people. And Scott yeah. was more into the set material. And Scott and I were friends. He was a groomsman at my wedding. You were also there, too. And we were close. It was the toughest call I had to make. But I, I put Louis to host the second half. And Scott, I know, was hurt by that. But you were such a natural. You know that I thought I, I got to have him do that. You You're know? very sweet to say that, but it was my it was in my nature to I felt comfortable just talking and but you know it uh, it's uh, you know, all I want to do all I want to say right now is as soon as uh, we all get our vaccines, I see a show <laughs> in Minneapolis oh, yeah. <laughs> and all around Minnesota. It would and be Patrick, so much you're fun. You're not writing the play. I'm writing. And, <laughs> it would be so much fun for all of us to go out on tour again because oh, these yeah. years that we spent together definitely were the highlights, whether we want to, they were just the highlights of our lives. They were our, our journey and it was so good and I'm so glad we're all still kicking. Well, you know, we're, we're all, that is the surviving thing. By the way, that picture of the original five, I have every intention of being the last one standing in that picture. Well, it's <laughs> That's probably, another story. <laughs> That's my another story. Might, yeah, my doctor might it agree with like you. So. <laughs> right? well, here's the thing I, I really want to bring out was 
Liz, you've traveled. Joel, you've traveled. Scott, Scott, you were the you were the one guy who stayed. I think Pat is falling asleep. <laughs> You're falling <pretty> asleep. <laughs> Jeff, time here, guys. Much. We got a lot to talk about here, real quick. I just because I want to bring Joel and I want to bring Louie back into this here. I want to jump forward a little bit here, and I want to talk post Mickey Finns a little bit. What I want to talk about is, you know, after things kind of splinter and everybody starts to go their own way, you guys end up over with Dudley Riggs, and that's somebody who I really want to make sure we get some time to talk about here. Yeah. Dudley Riggs, of course, you know, who unfortunately isn't with us anymore. He's <coughs> over at you know his theater. He's a he's he's a comedy guy, but he's a stage guy. He's a plays guy, and you guys come over there and you create the Minneapolis Comedy All-Stars. Louis, yourself, Joel, Jeff Cesario, and Alex Cole. And tell me a little bit. So, Louis, I want to start with you here because ah, I know you hair. started this group. <laughs> What's that conversation like with Dudley? Walk me through when you go down and you tell Dudley Riggs, hey, I want to do stand-up, and I think I got the right guys for it. I'm, I think Dudley might have been involved, to be honest with you. Well, I think Dudley was uh, mm -hmm. what helped us with it because – I'll be honest with you. Maybe it was Jeff and Joel even. Well, Louis, when yeah. I left town, when I left town, I told you, I said, what do you, you said, what am I going to do? And I said, well, we had done a show with Dudley one time uh, at, for a couple of weeks. And I said, Louis, I think you should go there. And I was, uh, that was, oh, my, like, you know, I, words, never, I think, was it Jeff Cesario who came up with the sports theme? Probably. Because yeah. I don't remember who did it. I just remember, oh, will this work? That's what I thought. Is this going to work? And then we took a picture usually with Dudley in it. And then they would name the show. We didn't know if you just took four, five, or six single stand-ups and named the show, you'd sell out. <laughs> <laughs> that was really the truth. It yeah. would sell out every show. And we'd go, huh, it's just us. Here you go. We're selling out. Um, you know? And, and well, Dudley uh, gave it so much credibility. All of a sudden, it was yes, uh, it did give Dudley us a lot of credibility. Uh, Yeah, so many people who had never yeah. heard of the Mickey Finns, you know, because it, it was such a small happening niche. But you know, Dudley was an established brand name, crazy. And you know, one of the things that I was thinking of too. Uh, so, so Louis approached uh, me and Jeff and Alex uh, about doing a couple of Sundays. This was after you had already done something, Jeff. And all of a sudden, we were doing a couple of Sundays in a row. And then I know that you negotiated some kind of deal for like a special weekend. And then that sold out. So that kind of sealed uh, you being able to do these month long, you know, runs. And it, it was, uh, you know, incredible. And the, the big difference is it was a theater. And all of a sudden, we're playing to a theater crowd. So like these people were all sitting in line, you know, like this. And there weren't tables. Uh, we so were thrilled. No table we noise. Thrilled. Just yeah. by, it should, it by, should be by. mentioned that that was the ETC theater in the seventh yeah. area, not the Hennepin theater. Yeah, which I mean, is even bigger than the yeah. Hennepin. Yeah, it was bigger. It was bigger. Yeah. So it was like crazy. All of a sudden, we'd come out on stage, which was higher, like a big proscenium stage, and the people would give you so much right off the bat. Like you'd have to prove that you were bad to them because they're paying a couple more dollars. They're in a theater. It's Dudley Riggs. So they said you already were ahead of the game. Uh, and, and I think that really helped all of us just be able to do what we wanted to do, work on material and not have to like deal with with crowds. And not that Mickey Finn's was like a horrible heckler place or anything. It was just rowdy. It was just a fun, yeah. rowdy place. Oh, to work. It was a to, to, two different environments. Yeah. Totally. You know, I think uh, I think that the thing I noticed most, I mean, I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this whole thing. You know, we really were, and I'm not bragging, but we had a great group of stand-ups, and we were helpful with each other's stuff. There was always a little talk after each act. If we had something, we were generous, yeah, and we good. wanted everybody to succeed. And now maybe it's because we were all so different, so it, it, it played into that. But I don't think I ever had more fun on stage than in Minnesota, even though I love all the stuff I've done. I don't think I ever, I don't know. I don't think I ever had shows like I had in Minnesota. And now this is an interesting mix with the all-stars you guys have here because, you know, Louie, you kind of had cut your teeth over at Mickey Finn's. You guys got Alex Cole, who he's kind of the, you know, he was doing comedy for ah. forever at colleges and all this stuff. So he's got a really polished act. And then Joel, you and Jeff are kind of the new guys, right? Like you're kind of still building this act. 
So what's that like? I mean, kind of having all these different guys who are different points in their career, you know, working off of each other. Do you ever feel like you're stepping on each other? Did you ever feel like, you know, there was ever any competition? What was that like? Well, there was a little uh, competition. I mean, Louis mm -hmm. and Alex always closed the show. So me, so Dudley wanted to have an intermission because it's a theater show. We never heard of that intermission before, but that's what he wanted. So there he would wanted be to sell car. some drinks. He wanted to yeah. sell oh, some coffee. Yeah, and coffee. Yeah. 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 Be smart, right? And so there yeah. would be uh, like a 45, uh, 50 minutes, 10 minute break, and then another 50 minutes. And Jeff and I, and uh, so Louis or uh, Alex would close the first half and then switch. Uh, for the second half to close the actual show. And then Jeff and I would do the same thing. So, so except for that, cause they were the stronger acts to close, close the halves. Uh, but was there, we all wanted to do great. And you know, we all wanted to, you know, Louie and Alex, of course, were, were most dominant cause they were like, you know, they, they were the big swingers. But at the end of the day, if anybody had the best show of the night for whatever reason, everybody was really happy for them. And we all worked on each other's material. Like we'd hear yeah, a line. I, don't, I never. A line I mean, always. I mean, all every single one of us thinks we're the best stand up. So that's just how stand ups are. And if we didn't, then we'd be really worthless as stand ups. We right. all we all have our own thing, and it's a bright, shiny, uh, beaming star in ourselves. And we we had we were. <laughs> It wasn't so much Alex and I don't feel like I competed. I uh, I think Alex and I were more story-ish tellers than we were just joke, joke, joke. You know what I mean? Well, it's like I think we're, you guys, uh, yeah. you guys raised I think we, the bar for each other. You really did. You well, raised yeah. the bar. I've always I, compared I, it to, to downhill skiing. You know, it's not a team sport. It's who gets down the hill and somebody's going to crash on the way down. <laughs> And you keep acting like you didn't enjoy it, but let's not kid ourselves. You enjoy it when somebody bombs because you're going, well, you know, and it's not me, but at the same time, that was more scared. so, Jeff, I think that was more so when, you know, you, I got out to LA uh, and or in the bigger cities, but I never felt that with the group in Minneapolis, uh, as yeah. Lou was saying. Never had that weird competition. We're always like, more, more collegial. Because right? we would do it so well behind your back, Joel. Well, of course, but you know, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> so one of the questions I want to ask Dudley Riggs, and I want to jump into some questions here because we got a lot coming in from people. But, you know, another thing, aside from the All-Stars, you know, once that caught on, Dudley Riggs started doing a lot more comedy. You know, he had, uh, you know, open stages where people could try out comedy for the first time. He was doing a all-women's review show called What's So Funny About Being Female. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to over Great. you because you actually got up for the very first time at Dudley Riggs, right, at the ETC. Yeah, with Jeff Cesario hosting, and then I never did weekends until it was the ghettoized lady show. You know, put the lady <laughs> on, because um, that's what we had to do. But the thing that was so fascinating was, you know, it's, in comedy for me, like, being a, being a woman, you know, I was unclear that I had something to say in stand-up, because the women that I saw, like, Stephanie Hodge was incredible, because she would do, like, impressions and characters and Susan Voss talked about being a, a wife and a mom and I was like this punk rock kid and I didn't see myself in the women but I did see myself in in some of the dudes and how you guys were talking in your experiences and so you know to me the representation of it was incredible and that show even though it was all women um it was really different interesting women you know it was Phyllis Wright and me and um was it um um, Sue Halloran was Sue there? I don't think so. it was. No. Sue was with us at Finns. I remember that. It was uh, um, Joan Stocking. Oh Joan Stocking. Joan Stocking. Yeah. Priscilla. Oh, Priscilla. Oh, yeah. Priscilla. Yeah. Priscilla, yeah, Priscilla. Um, and maybe, gosh, I can't remember who Karen Pickering. Maybe hi, Karen. I know you're there. Oh yeah. Um, um but it was um, it was just that much stage time was great, and Riggs was. Riggs was really cool, but really for me, it was um, when Scott, I think I met Scott at the open mics at Riggs, and when Scott opened up Comedy Gallery, um, it was, come along, I think you're funny, and I Definitely. really want to nurture you, and the, the Comedy Gallery was really where I um, was able to cut my teeth in a way from Scott, just putting me on all the time as much as I wanted and weirdly believing in me. And I don't know if you remember this, Louie, but the first time I ever got to headline at the Comedy Gallery, you flew in and opened for me. 
and made sure that my name was bigger on the marquee than yours or on the um, flyer. It was cool. It like was really touching. And I remember. Wow. That, when did that happen? Hang on, Jeff. <laughs> the first night you headlined, Liz, he came in, Louie came in and did a guest set. You asked me to MC, and you have had to follow Louie and I. Yeah. And you came off the stage, and I'm at the box office selling tickets to the second show. And you came up to me just beaming. I followed both of you guys. And <laughs> it was so good. I, I, I didn't die. It wasn't worse. And that's why you're paid to do it. <laughs> it's a really good learning curve in the sense of um, putting, you know, to me, so much about doing stand up and learning it is following good people is the way you do it. Following shitty people is never great. And it's just energy wise building a show, Scott. And I think that's one thing that I really loved about working at your club and doing your shows was you, you built a momentum within a show. So even sometimes it would be like, Liz, I want you to host the show. And it's like, but I'm actually as somebody who should be middling. And you would say, but your energy should kick it off because that's how the show needs to build. And I really understood that. And I really appreciated learning about energy and talent and and all that stuff. So I thought that was really cool. Well, back then, I think women, there were so few women that you, women had to find a niche that they could fit into in the middle of, of what was a male-dominated performance thing. And so I think for the women who were from that era like you are, it was good for you because you found, I need to find my spot. I deserve my place here. Yeah. And and you were able to find that place. And it wasn't about sexism. It was just about being funny and finding your place. Well, you know? in Minneapolis, I would say it's one of the few cities in comedy that there, I did not experience sexism in the work. I would say the other 49 states. <laughs> um, but as far as- still waiting people, for a shot, Liz. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but being able to develop in a place to just have my own voice and say it because it's a radical act to be a woman and stand on stage and say, I have the, I'm going to have some opinions. You know, no one's yeah. asking for that. Yeah. Right. And it's just a quick, uh, quick shout out to Joan Stocking. If, oh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And, was, and Priscilla and Priscilla. For sure. was a, well, Joan was a, was a true pioneer though. She was with us in the Finns days. You know? very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that was really tough. That was really tough for a woman because it was, right in front of you. It was not a cultivated audience and she had to stand yeah, there and come on funny. and, and so many funny. nights she'd walk off and she'd be in tears just about yeah. come back the next week, you know, and she'd yeah. do it again. Well, hey, I know we, uh, I want to make sure we leave some time for because there's a lot of stuff coming in about the comedy gallery and that's a great one, but I want to take a quick second here. I want to stop and we got so many questions that have come in here. So let's go ahead and take a couple of quick questions and then we're going to talk comedy gallery, Scott. We got a lot of questions about that. So let's start here. Sarah Sawyer, Says, is there something about Minnesota audiences or our ways of communicating that make it exceptionally great training grounds for stand-up? I'll open it up to the group. Anybody? I'll just say right off the bat that there are more theater seats in Minnesota than anywhere except Broadway. So I will say New York City has more theater seats and more the audience is much more sophisticated and rooting for from you know, a play that's trying to get on, on its feet to single performances. And I just think that they have a rich soil that we got to use. You know, they they would give it up to you, but they were not gratuitous. And if they didn't like something, well, you know, Minnesotans that do that thing with their nose. And if they didn't like something, they let you know. And I just thought, I think that we honestly didn't even know how much training they provided for us. So I think it has to do with they're such sophisticated first. They've been going to theater for an awful long time there and they've been appreciating performances. So that would be my take on it. And I would just, I would echo that and say, you know, when you have, and, and you know, and this sounds dumb, but I think it's real, the weather, the storytelling, the Scandinavian nature, you know, of, of long winters people learn patience when 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 storytelling and they love a story and people who can tell good stories i mean so many of the comics you're looking at right now are some of the best storytellers in the business 
And then you add Garrison Keillor and you add Franken and you add a long line of people who are learn to tell stories to an audience that will. Um, and also, I feel like the audiences judge you joke by joke. <laughs> yeah. They would hate yeah. You Which I never cared for. In total. They would be like, that was good. What's the next one? Oh, I hated yeah. that. But I'll wait. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I feel like that's part of it, yeah. too. Okay. Right. Well, like, go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. Quickly, I like to answer quickly. And I'll turn it over to Scott, who's got the greatest depth of experience of all of us in that area because you put on shows for 30 years. So I, was, I will gladly yield to you. I would just say they were not the greatest audience of all. If I had to pick a city, it's San Francisco. And I think you know what I'm talking about, Joe. They are just huge comedy fans there. I mean, I would get standing ovations there before I got standing ovations anywhere. And they were just loyal and they loved comedy. It didn't have to be from, you didn't have to be from San Francisco. And Liz, you played there too. You know what I mean? It's just fantastic. I ate it when I went there, be, to be honest. Really? I yeah, love I it. I never went there at and all. What I'm just saying is Minnesota, great training ground. But like Liz was saying, they, they sort of grade every joke one at a time. They don't learn what a role is. San Francisco, once you got a role going, they were on your side and they would put you over the top. And I had some of because I think it's because I made fun of the sourdough bread was my opening. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Jeff, if I could just say this about you, Jeff, you were yeah. a big city boy right from the beginning. You were a New Yorker. You never yielded that. You weren't interested in becoming a Minnesota performer in that yeah. sense. You were a comics comic type person who just said, I am not, I don't care what you, you would make fun of Minnesotans too. And yes. you know, and when they didn't get something, you were never pleased about it. But I think that you, probably San Francisco, uh, I think San Francisco was a hipper place for you there when you went yeah. there, and yeah. more more cosmopolitan. I mean, yeah, was. more hip because Minnesotans are cosmopolitan. But you, you know, you really said that nice, Louis. You really did. Well, I don't. You know, like you know, we all. I didn't know you could tiptoe that well. But it's really not. Well, I mean, I mean, Scott, Jeff, Scott got mad. Jeff got mad. You know, he got mad, and we enjoyed it. We enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to another question here, real quick, before you know, before we well, keep it. Jeff, you answered to me five right. minutes ago. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, All right, guys, we have right, another question. question? Are educated. It's quite simple. All right, here we go. This is a question. Mm -hmm. Louie, this is one for you here. So um, there's a documentary. If you go to mncomedy.com, you can see it there. An old documentary from 1981 with a bunch of you guys in it. And Louie, in the documentary, you say, you know, you'd stay in Minnesota unless a bigger opportunity came along for you in another city. So Dan wants to know, what was that bigger opportunity that got you to leave? As long as we're talking about Cosmopolitan and leaving in California. Well, I could, own, I, I could, own, I mean, I was up to my 99th farewell show, um, for one thing. Um, but the, past by the real Cole. truth, the real, it's true. I know I don't deny it. Um, I did not want to, I did not want to leave. I was very comfortable there. But Rodney and Joan Rivers said I should get, to one of the coasts and I really like did I didn't want to go because I love Minnesota love the people and then I only picked uh, the west coast for one reason I did not want to be in cold weather anymore mm -hmm. I probably had a uh, I probably would have thrived in New York too and been a different kind of comic but um, that's it's the reason they, they, they really wanted me and then Jeff was out there so I felt safe because I could stay with Jeff and Jeannie. And that was a big comfort to me. And uh, that was very appreciated. And Jeff was very accommodating and did everything he could to help me when I got there. And we, and, and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have made, I, I, I don't think if I didn't have that, because Minnesotans don't want to go somewhere strange, you know, we didn't want to go, but Jeff was there so I could, you know, 
I could stay in their room for so <laughs> much a month. And I was thrilled. You were with, with us that. for almost three years. I remember that. I like, know. I you know I'm I didn't want to leave there either. So. <laughs> until, we, until we upped the rent, I think it's yeah, finally moved out. <laughs> well, I think it was uh, Rodney and Joan that said you should move out of there, right? So yeah. You get your own. <laughs> out of, out of Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so that's why. That's why I didn't want to go, but uh, it turned out okay. Very good. You see, Joe, what I was doing a Minnesota laugh there when you said something where you move your face, but nothing comes out. Yeah, yeah that, that's true about Minnesotans. Oh, I remember Scott would always tell the audience, "You self-righteous Minnesotans." You used to always say that. You self-righteous Minnesotans. And I always, yeah, I, I, would, I would clap loud when you did that because I always thought there was a bit of that indignation sometimes. And then I would ask, I have to ask somebody, what's self righteous? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, well, back. <laughs> well, definitely keep the questions coming. We'll try to get a few more in here. We can probably run a couple minutes long as long as nobody has anywhere to be. But, um, Scott, I want to take some time for you because so much of this book, you know, I feel like as I was learning about this and writing the book, you are by far, in my opinion, the most complex character about this book. And the reason I think that is because, you know, a lot of great performers, we've got people like, you know, Steve Billings and folks who came in and promoted clubs. You're doing all this, though. You know, you're a performer. You're creating these clubs, the comedy gallery. You're trying to create opportunities for other comics. So you're kind of trying to, you know, keep your hands in all these different things. So let's back up first here. For those who don't fully appreciate, I think, the comedy gallery, I'll call it the comedy gallery empire. At your peak, Scott, how many rooms and clubs are you operating between, not just in the Minnesota, but just, I mean, even in the surrounding area? What's your footprint like comedy-wise at your peak? We have 35 locations. Unbelievable. Um, including the Rambo tour? <laughs> including the Rambo tour. Ah. Uh, Range from Winnipeg to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Unbelievable. And you're putting up shows, I mean, pretty much every night of the week in a lot of these towns, right? No, it was mostly the, the, like the Rambo Tour and these things that we talked about were one-nighters. There were some weekend clubs in like Little Rock. We had a weekend club, which had the cheapest owner in the world. And uh, you had, went there and there was one condo for three comics. The headliner got the bed. The middle act, right, Jeff, he knows this. The middle one got got a mattress on the floor. And the opener got the That's box. The truth. Ring. That's not an exaggeration. Got a box spring with a sleeping bag on it. <laughs> and some were really big rooms, and you know, we had Des Moines for a while, other cities, and mm -hmm. we did one of these tours, and the comic went on. Sure. Yeah. I headlined the Carp Festival in Des Moines, Iowa. How <laughs> was it? And, and, and the reason that I headlined was because <laughs> Tom Arnold didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> How was it? How did you do? How did you do, Liz? Um, I think I did okay. <laughs> and I got I could eat my weight in spaghetti. And old spaghetti works, but Carp <laughs> Festival. I mean, come on. Scott, I mean, what, what year was the hype? A wonderful. They, uh, you know, moniker to have. The, I know. Yeah. We used to what joke you about it. We, we, Louis and I would joke about Scott calling up. I got a gig for you it's somewhere west of Bismarck, and then yeah. you go back to Iowa, and then you return to North Dakota. And we're like, who's doing this routing? Oh my <laughs> God! You're traveling 400 miles at a time <laughs> to get back and forth. Well, it's a, as we call it, etch a sketch tour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But I, I'm, not, I'm just going to talk. Uh, I'm just going to. I I I just want to talk about how many. I was talking to Scott uh, last week, and I said, Scott, I don't know if you know this, but it is likely that I did more shows with you than all my other shows. Really, that many? I think so, Scott, because. I think we did that in one week in Wisconsin. Uh, I'm serious because I, I came back year after year after year and I would do weeks at the comedy gallery because I needed my Minnesota love. Yeah. And um, I, I remember LA comics telling me, where's Louie? And I said, he's barnstorming with Scott Hanson. <laughs> uh, like I, wouldn't trade any, I wouldn't trade any of that. And I think that you, you definitely put uh, Minnesota on the map for the, with the comedy gallery. And I was a very, I, I mean, I, like I said, I think I did more 
shows with you than I did any well, other time. You know there was a knock on Scott. Oh, no. You're self-promoting, you're self-promoting. You know, if I was doing all that work, I'd be self-promoting too, you know, because you were providing work for other comics. And yeah, you worked there too, as you should have, you know. And I never understood the grind with some comics who would hold that against you. I said, well, he's doing it. He's the guy, he's, he's putting his name on the license. He's buying the liquor, you know, he's doing all the work. So yeah, I think he does have a right to put his name out there as part of what's going on. You know, and I always felt that that undercurrent wasn't a fair criticism. I would also just like to add, and Scott, like we're talking about you and I want to hear your take too. But one thing that I do want to say that was invaluable to somebody who came in when I did was I was allowed to stay in the Twin Cities. I was allowed to develop an act, develop my confidence. And not only that, all of these national headliners came through the Twin Cities constantly. So I was able to develop friendships with Jerry Seinfeld and Richard Lewis and every Roseanne, every headliner, so that when I moved out to the coast, A, I was ready, and B, I had people who had confidence to vouch for me. And that was and that cannot be said enough for people who were in my sweet spot right there. And that's true for so many folks. And and like it was incredible. You you gave us this incredible gift of the safety of not having Hollywood eyeballs on you when you weren't ready to have them on you. And that was really just incredible, I have to say. For sure. Well, you know, I appreciate it a lot a lot, Liz. I really do. But a lot of times what people don't understand is that the Minnesota audience was so good <laughs> to come here, big stars. And work for free before they would do a special or a letterman still doing that yeah jim gaffigan before the pandemic was yeah. back there doing i go where's jim and i said to his manager he goes he's back in minnesota getting ready uh for a special and i go kevin, kevin meany kevin meany kevin meany hey jim. kevin meany. And, uh, big pan people Damon did it too one time didn't That's he? Not right Dana That's Gould, not right. back in time liz what didn't Dana Gould do the same thing? He came back. Rob Schneider came back. Yeah, they were all living in my basement. They would stay in my basement. They would come to the comedy gallery home? and they would stay in my basement. Nothing like a Minnesota basement. But... Liz? What? Didn't Dana leave some message on your phone? Oh, my right? God. This <laughs> story. So Dana Gould comes into work at the – Dana Gould, great comic, uh, wrote on The Simpsons forever, just stellar. One of my dear friends. So Dana comes Great train of consciousness comic. Yes. Just, just. Incredible. So Dana comes in and he's working the comedy gallery for New Year's Eve. And he comes in and spends, he's going to spend Christmas with my family. And then we're doing the comedy gallery together <laughs> over New Year's Eve. Um, we get in late. We were traveling together someplace else. We get in late. Um, he goes, oh, you're back in town. I'll make your answering machine message for you to tell people that you're back. I'm like, okay, I go in the shower. Um, what <laughs> my dad, I hear, I play the, the message, the one message I got after he did, and it's my dad saying, get that off your phone right now. And I was like, Dana, what did you write? And he goes, I was kidding. I heard the message and it's, Liz can't come to the phone right now. She's sucking off Don King. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so then, so then, <laughs> We have to go to my parents' house for Christmas. Unbelievable. It's the first time, I believe, in Minnesota Historical Society history that oh. sucking off Don King has been said on officially sanctioned event. Yeah. So thank you for that. <laughs> you know, I'm just oh, telling you. I'm glad it up. I did not introduce it. You told it. You told it all. You're coming into the club at night and you're going, you're not going to believe what Dana did to me. The first word to go is my father. <laughs> I uh, I heard she was having lunch with Don King. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, so Scott, I want to get back to you for a second about the comedy gallery and then take a couple of questions. Then we've got some coming in here. How do you, so, you know, we've all talked about some of the people who were there and, you know, obviously you, you know, bringing in new people. How do you build this thing? I mean, what was kind of the, the secret for you in order to turn from this, like, hey, we're kind of figuring out to making this big business, to making this like a destination for comedy, both for comics and for audiences? Well, some of it was happenstances. First of all, this, we would get the last call 
from a club owner if everything else didn't work. <laughs> it was, well, the disco didn't work. Well, the Chippendales didn't work. What are we going to do? <laughs> well, we hear there's this comedy thing going to the Twin Cities. Ring, ring. True. Ring, it's true. You know, and we do book the shows. You know, we go out and do them, you know. And part of it, the audience was so prime. I was on, we had a TV show on Channel 9 every Friday night. I mean, the, the comics would come in, the headliner would be in the show. We'd do four shows on a Sunday. They'd run in, the, in places like North Dakota, South Dakota, didn't have cable yet. So we were on the cable as their independent station on Channel 9. So Friday night, we we're on every week at all these markets. So they saw the show, had the name recognition, and bam, we started putting together shows. You know, it was quite simple. It was like word of mouth spread. And as long as the shows were good, people were coming out to see him. And, and then you'd send remember. Bruce Murray out, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> I think he just died, didn't he? That was insane. Uh, that was really inside, but really good inside, Joe. Yeah. I got to ask you something on an embarrassing level, Joe, because you you talked about how you were developing stand up and you were growing and you were getting good. And you were part of the comedy all stars. How did you wind up partnering? With Bob Lincoln, when you were already doing stand up on your own, so I got to ask you, how did you get that? He had a car. How, how should we say that? Right? <laughs> uh, uh, he had a car. So I knew Bob from San Diego. So Bob uh, and I were buddies in San Diego. He'd been doing it about the same, about a year, open mics, and uh, we started doing because we were both kind of getting a little bored. We started doing a, a team act. It was basically, I look back at now, it was a ventriloquist act, it, basically. And Bob was the dummy. It was like, hey, be nice to everybody. And uh, he mouthed off. And so we came, I go, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to move back to Minneapolis. Uh, uh, there's a scene there. We could get some stage time. And he said, well, man, I'd like to come with. And I go, all right, well, we can move back there. And uh, But I did tell him, I, you know, I, I'll do some team act, uh, but I, I want to pursue my solo act as well. And... Um, I found out quickly, as much as I don't like to do any work, he liked to do it. And Louis knows him very well because he came back to L.A. with Louis uh, for a while and helped Louis out. He liked to do less work than me. So it was always dangerous. <laughs> if I'm the hard worker in the organization. And that's yeah. kind of what happened. And we just couldn't uh, we never progressed from like a 10 minutes. We just never got past 10 minutes. And I said, you know, I kind of you know, told Bob it's kind of over. And he did stand up for a little while and then managed for a while and did some other stuff. Louis, any tell the part where he took where he took your act. That you can't miss that one. And you came down to the La Jolla Comedy Store and sat in front of him. You cannot. Now, how do you know? How do you know that story? Did I tell you that story? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. And I don't forget those stories. Yeah, that's that's he funny. Was I, your act, wasn't he? Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. Uh, yes, indeed. That's that's a really interesting thing. I forgot. Yes. Yeah, so he moved back to San Diego and was doing my my jokes, which. You can tell how generic they were if anybody could do them. And he uh, he was on stage. I have sat in the back of the comedy store. It was very dark in there. And I waited. I had heard that this was happening from another person. And he started into my my act. And so I slowly creeped to the front row and sat right there. And it just kind of, he went white. And then we had a nice little conversation outside. I go, Bob, come on. You know, you can't be that lazy. Write some of your own jokes. But uh, yeah, that did happen. Not many people can catch somebody doing it right live. You actually caught him live. Yeah, I did. And you know what? He was better at it. I'll be honest. He got it. <laughs> that was the thing. Oh, I you're a gracious to... person, Joe. You're a gracious person. <laughs> you're gonna steal and Bob, it. And Bob, is a, Bob underneath all of the things, he was a very sweet guy, man. Bob was he, a really he, sweet guy. I haven't, seen him, in, I haven't seen him in a long, long time. I I, I don't know where he don't is. Know yeah. No, he he was he was a sweet guy. Uh, yeah, he just you, was you a sweet guy. You couldn't the name of the act. The act was good. Lincoln and Madison, or was it Madison and Lincoln? It, Lincoln, Lincoln and, and Madison. Madison. It was you. a great Louis name. On the road. We did a college. That's with right. Louis and, and that uh, was more fun. Like the adventure was always more fun. Where are we going to eat? Yeah. What are we going to do after? Can we? Should we leave tonight and just drive back? You know, it's all that kind of stuff with comics. Well, you know, we're, not, we're, we're not comfortable in other places. Well, it's like you're always, oh, well, comics have always been there. We've always been the caboose on the train. We've always been the odd duck. But you didn't mention part of our bravado at Vince. The game wasn't over after we did our set. God knows if you did five new minutes, you had something to really brag about. But we would play poker in the back of the room. That was where we would finish the rest of our vitriol. 
against each other. Uh, there was money on that table more than we were making from working. And I don't know how where it came from, but I remember a lot of money on that table. And Louis, you were in the middle of it. <laughs> All I know is I was a terrible poker player. Eventually, I would get tired and hungry and just lose all my money. <laughs> well, guys, we've, kind of, we've run the light here a little bit. we got a couple more minutes. We'll stick on a couple more, but I want to get a few more questions in here because there's a lot of people have. So let's jump into a couple of questions real quick, and then we'll close it out here in just a couple of minutes. So question here from Dan. Dan wants to know from everybody, oh, this is interesting. Who are your favorite comics on the scene in Minneapolis now these days? Oh, I'm old. I don't know anybody. <laughs> <that time. laughs> I know my nephew, Josh Florhawk. Josh have comedy. I have a, a great nephew who's doing comedy, and uh, he moved out to L.A., but he was one of my favorites. Uh, oh, what's the guy's name that MCs there all the time? It's such a great guy. Pete? Uh, Oh, Pete, Pete Borchers, Borchers, of course, one Pete of my Borchers. favorites. I, was, I, was I love Pete Borchers. I love Pete. Borchers. Yeah. I and uh, Jen Shaw is funny, really funny. Yeah, Jen Shaw, very funny, very funny. But I don't really know. And then Patrick Bauer, I always enjoyed his act. And, yeah. uh, you know, I just thought, you know, when you'd go back and you'd go, oh, uh, I, you'd feel old. I always feel old when I see comics. I go, oh, I got to, I should probably get some more energy. Well, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's funny when you hear him talk about, man, that's back in the old days, 08, 09, I'm going, yeah. that's the old days? Yeah, the old days. Oh, my God, I got dirty thoughts older than that. You know, so, so here's, like, a, so here's a question for you to piggyback on this, because I actually am curious for everybody who's on this, not including the group that's on this, who were your favorite comedians from back when you guys were all part of the scene locally here? Not including the five of you who were looking at each other. Well, Bill and well, Alex. I mean, I mean, I got to say, Bill for one, yeah, and uh, because Bill Bauer was completely, he was completely original, and I miss him. And Alex Cole, Alex Cole was a killer act, man. Oh, killer comic. Yeah, he, he, well, I, I thought from an experimental basis, I, I would say uh, to be Rocky. Rocky Johnson was a guy who just yeah, Rocky was never great. met anybody so divinely yeah. insane. You know, he was uh, he was surf a surfer out of place. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. he he just had a, a sort of je ne sais quoi, you know, that was like, how can you do that? And yet he would do it, you know, and it was daring and amazing and and crazy, and it didn't work a whole lot, but sometimes it did work, you know. So that was for me. He was the guy who amazed me the most, you know. Sure. I like about you. Who wanted to go to the market barbecue. I didn't care about their act. Um, I, like, yeah, I know, right? Um, I would say there's a couple. Um, I love Paul Dillery. Love Dean Johnson. Oh, Paul Dillery. Um, and right. I really love Chris Rain. Say it Chris with Rain. me. Oh, Chris oh, Rain. Chris Rain. Funny happened on the me on the way to the club. I found a severed head in a bag. Like, yeah. like hilarious. Yeah. Uh, God rest my soul. Dean Johnson. Now you're bringing up all these names. We. You know, oh, you yeah. forget, but yes, those guys are all great comics. Very yeah. original. Hodson, come on, Lou. What? Joel Hodson. Oh, oh Hodson. yeah. Joel Hodson. Yeah, of course. Sure, sure. And also yeah. Frank Conniff. Yeah. And you know, and Jeff Cherbino, I'm sorry Jeff's not here because he did so much for all of us. I mean, Jeff, I'm sorry, Jeff Cesario. Jeff, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jeff. Um, oh, yeah, Cesario, but, who's not here. Who, uh, yeah, Jeff absolutely. did so much. He was great, a good, he was guy, good glue yeah. and a great politician for all of us. Mm -hmm. He was a really there, yeah, yeah. Oh, look at that. I was gonna say, I wanted to, speaking uh, of Paul Dillery, this is a picture I wanted uh, to make sure that we got in here. This is uh, Mike Gandolfi and Paul Dillery and Liz, you and Scott here. And I mean, this would have been what year is this? Do you guys think here? Eighty-three or four? Probably about that. Yeah. Liz, oh, did you get this? Liz, did you? Well, I only had two chins, so it had to be a while ago. <laughs> Did, Did you I identify was? as African American at that point? I know I'm racial girls though. I don't know wow. what's going on. I, I was so tan. What a tan! I know. I love to tan. Liz, that is a fantastic. That should be your promo shot from what? now on. Yeah. <laughs> <There's me. laughs> what? I have no idea what is happening in this picture. Uh, uh, I just, I just, uh, <laughs> I love it. No so copies of all these pictures, for God's sakes, they just are fantastic. Patrick, 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 you did, Patrick, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did a great job, uh, Patrick. You did a great job on this. You, thank you. You were a great tiptoeing politician, uh, <laughs> soothsayer. Uh, you know, you really did. You really were earnest, and you really seemed to care a great deal about what you were doing. And I, I think that that is a hard thing you navigated, and. Uh, I think everybody here appreciated it too. When I have everybody I've talked to said, you know, felt very comfortable with you and you should get a lot of props for doing it. And do we get any money for any? No. And, uh, no. Uh, you know, I, I'm but you know, he gets all the money. But, but we should definitely do, uh, we should, you know, thank you. I'll just say thank you and shut up. Thank Louis, you all very much. Thank I want you. to tell you my first meeting when Patrick told me about the book. He called me up and says, well, I, I've been talking around and I've heard that you had something to do with comedy in the Twin Cities. Nah. He had no I, idea who I was at the time. Just a little bit. Well, he, he, was going, you know? well, he resurrected what? He resurrected us. No, I mean, uh, 40 years I'll old. be honest. I knew the Scott Hansen's Comedy Gallery brand. I knew about the club brand. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize the profound impact you had from a performer standpoint and from a development standpoint until we really sat down and talked and started to dig into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew, yeah, I mean, I knew you as I'm like, oh, he had his name on the buildings. I know the clubs, but I mean, from a performer standpoint, I mean, like Louis said and Jeff said and Joel and Liz and everybody else has said, I mean, you really were. And I think people have said to me, and I think I said in the book, you were the original Minnesota comedian. I think Louis actually said this where you just were so Minnesota, it felt like, you know, your puns were great and you were, you were speaking to that Minnesota audience. And I'm from Wisconsin. So. We're all sitting I'm right now. It Lou, was Louis in Las Vegas. Liz is in New York. And we got uh, in LA is Joel. Hey, Joel. <laughs> That's Scott funny, Joel. In Minnesota. He's always had the flag planted there. Yeah. Put it on, Joel. Well, you know, the right. greatest. I just, I, 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 I am. I just am ready for a game. I'm very yes. I'm so happy. This is uh, like an elixir that we all got to see each other. Yeah. Yeah. Other yeah. and to spend this time I, together. I, I and Patrick, thank. Uh, no, Patrick, I, that's a tough job. Forty years of memories. From all these people, I wouldn't want to try and go through that. Well, also, I think you should mention, Scott, there are some. Uh, and about World War II, you know, you think about it. There, there, there are some fireworks in that book. Oh, I just want to say that. that for the readers. It's not all nice. It's not all love book either, which is awesome. That's what you want to read. Yeah, some, uh, that's. Uh, and uh, uh, whatever you add to Skullduggery, which I don't well, know. They, they didn't have the words frenemy back then. They didn't have the words bipolar back then. They didn't have a lot of the terms that we have for it now. We didn't know about all that. We learned about it later on. <laughs> but just as a sales tool, it's not all nice stuff. You can dig in and it's... Yeah, uh, and there's a lot yeah. of meat in it. Yeah. <laughs> for the so reason. Any home here, the last couple minutes. The, Go ahead, Liz. Is there any anecdotes about the House of Coats? That's all I want to know. <laughs> Oh, uh, I told you. Comedy the club is across the street from a poisonous nuclear plant. I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, in our last two minutes, bring me home here. I want to know. Forty years. I mean, we've talked about so many things. You all have so many different memories. We've talked about, but you know, when you look at your own careers and you look at just kind of how that period influenced you as people and as comedians, you know, what's kind of your what do you kind of feel like the legacy is? We'll say that. That's kind of our wrap up here. What do you think your legacy is? And what do you think the Minnesota comedy legacy is based on kind of your experience during that period? Scott, I want to start with you. Well, the legacy is people like her on the screen right now. You know, for me, the, uh, I just put a name up in a place where people could come and perform, you know. And comics today, when I work with them, I tell them, if you're serious, go out to L.A. You know, because you're not going to even get the stage time here you really want because you don't have the quality clubs. You know, so to me, my legacy is all people like Joel, who's gone out there and done a great job in, in the industry. Liz done so much. Jeff has done so much. When you look at Sid Youngers and, you know, again, Dolphy, Tom Arnold. They've all done great jobs out there. You know, Louis, you know, is an industry on his own, you know. Joel Hodgson starting all of his shows, you know. He's the reason I started the club was Joel Hodgson. 
You know, he wasn't getting on stage time. You know, and this guy was good. I mean, you could just look at him and know he's going to be a star, you know. And his comics like Liz, the reason Liz got stage time, you could have listened to her act and you wouldn't even know a woman was on the stage. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, so, that's a big compliment, but it is not a true. And yeah, Liz, Liz you were serious. She knows it. She's like, a stand up, stand up. Just like, you know? We're all stand up, stand ups. We're stand ups. Yeah. We're solid. And I told about you. Are you going in order or are we going to keep going here? Well, Patrick's in charge. Remember, Joe? Oh, yes, Am I, I in charge here? Come on now. I'm the smallest voice in the room. No. Joel, give it to me. What do you think? I mean, obviously, you were you were here for a period, then you went back out west. But I mean, when you think back on this, how does this kind of impact you? What's the what's your oh, memory right. of this period? This, this was like the fundamental growing years of, of everything. I mean, I owe my entire career to being in Minneapolis at the right time and the right place and, and running into Louie and Scott and, and Liz and you know, Tom Arnold uh, is, is still a friend of mine today who, uh, you know, is, uh, uh, you know, a loyal friend who uh, gave me my first gig in uh, television writing. And um, uh, just, just like it's weird because I've, I've been on a number of different shows and I've done, you know, a lot of TV work, but I still feel closer to these people in many ways mm -hmm. than all the people I worked with. And I stopped performing in like 92 uh, as a full time comic. But uh uh, I still have more fun, more more laughs with the comics, and especially these Minnesota comics. And I think it's because we weren't all crazy competitive of trying to try step on each other uh, and that type of thing, where we could actually uh, lay down the foundations of, of what we were doing. And I don't know any other city that is, is that uh, is like that. Great, Liz. What about you? I mean, I would be presumptuous to think that I have a legacy. What I would say is. The one thing that I feel incredibly grateful about is to be in a town that, you know, we just talked about this comedy time that we were there. It's important to remember that we also had one of the most important music scenes happening there and some of the most important journalists there. And this was a, this was a town that intersected with each other. I worked at a restaurant called Fagries as a bus person while I was doing comedy. And I would sh switch shifts with the guys from Soul Asylum, who were also being the waiters there, and so we could cover each other's gigs. And I think that to me, the most magical thing was that I was not only part of this incredibly beautiful comedy scene, but this incredible beautiful art scene where we were all connected with each other. And I would just say the one thing I feel grateful for was to be given enough time to have enough confidence to circle around my career and be able to find my activism and my career meshing in a way where I can make a difference and I can take all the hits from every hater out there and just know that I am doing the right thing. And I feel really grateful for that. Definitely. Jeff, what about yourself? What's your, uh, what's your thoughts when you think back on kind of your legacy and how this influenced you in comedy? Well, I think this moment, uh, I, I give a little homage to you that someone finally recorded it and put it down so that at least it's put down, you know, it's on paper, it's on a book, you know, because I think what we did was worthy enough to be noted, you know, because comedy has always been the caboose at the end of the entertainment train. We've always been the doormat in the entertainment business. We've sort of risen up and it's good to know the people I got to work with over the years. I went out to LA and guys had never even heard of being publicity. I was, here I was and featured in the Minneapolis Tribune. I got to be on TV. I got to, I got a small experience of what real show business was like. And I got to work with people like Andrew Dice Clay. And I got to work with people like Dennis Leary. And I got to work with people like Gabe Kaplan. And and there was people in Rodney Dangerfield and, and Kevin Nealon. And, and you're just people that were really, really good at what they did. And I got to be in there and sort of hang and bang and bump heads with them. At the end of the day, I didn't get the brass ring that Louie got. But there's a show was put together by the Boston comics and they, it was called when stand up stood out. And I'm just proud to be part of that generation when stand up did stand out Definitely. and it got you onto a sitcom. It got you onto things. It got you ahead of all those actors who were ahead of you. And I'm proud sure. to be part of that. At the end of the day, my legacy is this as a middle-class comic, got my kids through school. Uh, this pandemic has come along and I'm proud to say I'm, I'm, I'm safely retired, you know, Definitely. And I, it's hard to do. It's hard to be a middle class comic in this business. And I'll take what I got from that and be grateful for it. Sure. 
Very nice. Louis, bring us home. When you uh, look back at your career, I mean, you've you've done so much. You know, how does this this period kind of influence you, and how do you feel about you know how you influenced the comedy scene as a whole? Well, <clears throat> you never know how you influence the comedy scene until somebody comes up to you and says, "Hey, you really, I really liked your first special, or I saw you here or there." Um, this is my foundation. These years, 78 to 81, and then beyond, because I was in Minnesota lots of times, half the year, even when I was out in L.A., I would go back and work, because I, like I said, I felt at home. So this was my foundation that we, I, this is what I knew I could always go back to. These are all people that I still am in contact with. These are all people I have phone numbers. We have our phone numbers. We have conversations. We talk about all the things that everyone talks about. And um, I, I have to say that Minnesota, these people, plus Minnesota audiences, plus the fact that um, I got very lucky. I always say, you know, like I met a lot of comics who are 10 times funnier than I was. And I always said, you got to get a little lucky, too. And I was just a, a lucky in the right place at the right time. And I, I just am the most grateful person right now. And I do, I'm equally as excited about the fact that Patrick put this book together. Because this is important to us and me. Definitely. Well, I don't think anybody could say any better. I wish we had all night here because you guys have so many stories and there's so much we could talk about. Um, but I will let you all get on with your evenings. Once again, the book is Funny Thing About Minnesota through the Minnesota Historical Society Press. Scott, Joel, Liz, Jeff, Louie, thank you guys so much for taking the time here and hanging out with all of us and sharing some of your memories and bringing us back to uh, to the earlier times of comedy. Thank, thank you, Patrick. I love you guys. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Love you guys. Uh, bye. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great night. Is there a show you wanted to plug, Jeff? <laughs> yes. <laughs> March 26th, the Afton House. That's right. March 26th. Oh, I love that. I love the Afton House. I'm back in the business again. Oh, laugh goodness. your mask off. I named it. <laughs> uh, laugh your mask off. Very that's nice, right. Scott. God, that's, that's great. great. The master of the pun. Totally. <laughs> really All right. I'll say I'll bet one of my favorite lines Scott ever came up with was, let's call it Tundertainment. <laughs> <laughs> it still is something I might say just that, with no one around. <laughs> All right, you guys get the cards. You ready to play? Hey, okay. we'll take this to the after party. But no, hey, thank you to everybody who joined us. Thank you for all the questions and comments, and we will see you again soon. Bye now. Okay, thank